Good afternoon. My name is Maryam Alavi, Dean of Scheller College at Georgia Tech and Professor of Information Technology Management. It is my distinct pleasure and I'm delighted to welcome you to a very special and our first Neil Asks program uh, that is being held here at Scheller College. Today's program is a special part of our uh, impact lecture series and honors the legacy of L. Neil Williams, Jr. and Atlanta-based leader in the field of law, education, and the arts. It is wonderful to gather with so many of business and community leaders here today this afternoon, and uh, including special guest, Dennis Love of Print Pack. Where are you, Dennis? Just wave. Uh, whose support helped make today's program possible. And it's great to have Mr. Williams' widow, Sue, founder of Neil Asks Organization. Sue, where are you? Okay, great to have you here. And of course, we are delighted to have our Georgia Tech faculty, staff, students, and all the others. Welcome all. Our program today celebrates the example of service and leadership that Mr. Williams lived by asking important questions, listening to varied viewpoint and perspectives, and inspiring others to ask questions that would guide them toward greater understanding, innovation, service, and hope. He certainly uh, walked the talk before his passing in 2012. He was a graduate of Duke University and Duke Law School and had a distinguished 38-year career legal career in Atlanta with Alston and Byrd, and then he served as the first general counsel of Invesco Incorporated. As a leader in business, Mr. Williams also served as a corporate director in a variety of a number of companies. In the community, he served as chairman of the board of trustees of Woodruff Arts Center, member of chair and chairman of the board of directors for Atlanta Symphony and America Symphony Orchestra League and trustee and chair of Duke Endowment. The Neil Asks organization was established by Sue Williams, of course, and many uh, friends. And uh, the organization hosts lectures twice a year to extend his legacy. Each program is themed to answer a profound and important question. And the thought-provoking question for tonight is, how is effective and ethical business leadership developed? Uh, a very important and key question. And we have assembled a brilliant panel of individuals to discuss this particular question. I have John Brock at the very end, uh, retired CEO of Coca-Cola Enterprises, of course now, Coca-Cola European Partners. I have Larry Gellerstedt, and Larry is CEO of Cousins Properties, and Hala Muddlemug, President of Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. And this panel is moderated by my esteemed colleague, uh, Steve Salbu, who is uh, Cecil B. Day, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Chair of Business Ethics. So please help me to welcome our moderator and the panel. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And Dean Alavi, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction of everyone and all of the thanks as well. Uh, 
Also wanted to add, uh, because of the organizational aspect of this, uh, when Dennis and Sue and I were meeting, Linda Reed in our executive education office spent a ton of time organizing this. Linda, you're out there somewhere, I'm sure, right? Thank you so much, Linda. Um, and Terry and the Impact Speaker Series folks, you do such an amazing job with all of this stuff. We're grateful for that as well. And as you can see, we've got a fascinating topic here for everybody to think about. How is effective as well as ethical corporate leadership developed? Um, and uh, this, I believe, when we were batting all these ideas around, it was finally, Dennis, it was your idea that finally surfaced. And uh, the adding of effective to ethical, I think, was a really important thing because businesses are not only trying to do the right thing, they have to get things done and accomplished as well. And those two things often go in alignment, but there's also often stresses. Um, as Dean Alavi said, we've got an incredible panel of talent and accomplishment here, and I am going to go right over to them. They're each going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then we have the two Allens with microphones who are going to get all of your thoughts and questions and comments. And so I ask the same question, actually, under the Neil Asks protocol to all three of our speakers. So Larry Gellerstedt, how is effective as well as ethical corporate leadership developed in 10 minutes, Larry? <laughs> because it's such an easy question. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, it's uh, an honor to be here today. Um, Neil and Sue Williams have, have uh, been a part of my life, my whole life. And uh, we went to uh, church together for decades. And uh, Neil's firm, um, I see Ben Johnson's here, uh, represented uh, the construction company I ran for the first 20 years of my career. And um, um, except for the fact that uh, Neil went to Duke. I really can't find much to fault him um, with. Um, and it was an ugly game, but we did win the national championship in basketball um, and hadn't gotten accused of cheating again yet. So hopefully, hopefully we didn't do that at Chapel Hill. But um, it, uh, you know, the, the topic of ethical leadership is, you know, not an easy one just to say, well, it's this. Uh, because leadership is somewhat hard to define because there's all sorts of different leadership styles which are effective. Um, and a lot of that depends on the position, but also a lot of people, just how they carry themselves and how they communicate. Uh, one style uh, can be effective in certain situations and not effective uh, in others. Uh, but it is something that you can't just assume happens when you're running a business. Um, you have to uh, be intentional about it if you want to try to get the outcome uh, that you want. But combining uh, those two, you know, when I saw the question, it was, it hit me that you really can't separate those two. And so, you know, I thought the same thing when I thought, saw it as, are we here to talk about ethics or are we here to talk about leadership? And in reality, those two never should be discussed independently because they, they, they work collaboratively. Um, the business world's also changing. Um, I started in the, uh, my career in the late 70s in the construction business. And um, that was a, I remember my first boss in the construction business said to me, um, shut up, do what you're told for three years, and if you're good, then you can, I may be interested in an idea you have. And uh, honest engine. And, uh, and I didn't feel like that was anything different than what I expected to hear. And, um, you know, it was, you distinguished yourself uh, by being there longer than anybody else, nights and weekends, um, even if you didn't have that much to do. You know, it was very much of a culture in the construction business at that time, which was, uh, I would say, a top-down militaristic type of governing model. You didn't want to give a lot of room for interpretation to carpenters and bricklayers and things like that working out in the field. And it was, it was relatively uh, militaristic uh, in style. Uh, some of that was the times as well. Um, but since then, I've had an opportunity to run 
you know, a public company in the manufacturing area, Cousins Properties, which is a public company, real estate, and, and start a couple of businesses. And I find that although the methodology is somewhat different industry to industry and somewhat different depending on the scale of the company, um, the fundamentals when I look back at my career it, are really pretty much the same. Uh, regardless. So obviously in a small company when you start it, most things happen by just example and osmosis. You know, the three or four or five of you working around a table, you know, one, one person's problem is everybody's problem. You, you, you sort of learn just by benefiting from the, the team environment. As you get into uh, larger companies, you have to become more intentional about it. But the risk I've seen in large companies is it can it can become, become so uh, rote in terms of the way it's delivered that people look at it as another box to check. You know, I've got to fill out my ethics form again this year and answer those questions. And um, it, it doesn't, it can, it can get to where it loses uh, its meaning. Um, so when I thought about that in terms of what I found is effective is you can tell real quick with someone if what I would call basic ethics is not there. And those decisions are really pretty easy. I mean, if someone is not honest and straightforward in their business dealings, um, is, doesn't uh, treat other people with, with respect, those types of things, that's a relatively easy, you either don't hire them or pretty soon they get, they get pushed out of, out of the organization. But I've been in a variety of business. What I, what I find in each business where you begin to get in the, the gray zones is where ethics really lives. And it's because each industry that I've been in has sort of its common industry practice standards. And so you get into a gray zone and the way one industry practices may define ethical behavior and the way another industry practices may find it is different. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, when I was in the construction business, uh, one of the ways that was very much ethics in those times that if a vendor, like an air conditioning contractor, was giving us a bid on a project, you did not shop that bid. You got the bids, whoever was the most competitive bidder, even if the one that you like, number two, you like better, you went with that bid. And if you didn't go with that bid, the good contractors would quit pricing you or begin to add extra money to your cost. There are plenty of other, other industries that I've been in where an auction is very much a part of the business practice. You know, you, you put a number out, everybody then gets a second chance, then everybody gets a third chance, maybe it gets, gets narrowed down. And so what I find is you need to be very, very intentional, one, about big ethical issues, big value systems within the company. You, you need to you need to preach them, you need to live them, you need to preach them again. Uh, we do a thing at Cousins that uh, every quarter we take our values and we put out vignettes. Of, here's an actual example of a situation where this employee maybe was offered tickets to the Super Bowl by a vendor. You know, what did that employee say or do? Um, how is that handled? Um, and we try to, we have actual employees that have had circumstances come on up somewhere in our platform, you know, we work on that. But where I've found that you really even have to get more intentional are standard industry practices. And really drilling down on, are they really standard? Or it's just, just the, where the bad people play? And so you're sort of letting the bottom define the behavior of the industry. Um, 
And it sounds simple, but it's, it's, really, it's really not, because we all are incented to win. Uh, running a public company, you're very much incented to win on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. Um, but I have found that most of the time, there are significant what I call industry practices that if it doesn't feel right, if you feel like if you're having, to, you're having cocktails with friends after work that are in a different industry and you're having to say, well, I know this sounds bad, but this is the way it works in the construction industry. It probably is something that you want to dig in in your own company and find a way to differentiate yourself in a better way. So my father, who was in the construction business, when I started with sort of the, the no shopping of bids, the whole Atlanta industry shopped bids. And when my father started his construction company, he decided a way to distinguish was to not shop bids. Within a course of 10 years, because his strategy was right, the industry standard became don't shop bids. And to me, it sort of gets back, are you playing short ball or long ball? with a company and with your own reputation. Do you want, because in my career, it's gone on long enough now to where people that work for me are now clients of mine. You know that I'm, it, it, chairs shift over a career. And the one time or two times that you might have been forced into a gray zone that you're uncomfortable, if the company forces you into it, even though they say it's industry practice, you probably want to think about that. Um, is to, is it really, in, does it feel right? And there's subjectiveness in there. I'm not saying that there's one way on these questions. As I tell our leadership team, the easy questions on ethics and leadership never get to the top. By the time they get to the top, it's some nuanced situation and it's, I just can't tell you how important transparency and consistency and living by what you say is. And it is really, really smart business. May cost you some business short term, but it's, it's the, co the company I run today, Cousins Properties, is the oldest publicly traded real estate company in America. It went public in 1962. Think of all the recessions and disasters that have happened in the real estate industry between 1962 and today. Well, for 50 of those 62 years, Tom Cousins ran it. And when I took over running the company in, uh, in 09, which was a pretty turbulent time economically, Tom wasn't on the board anymore. His, his family was still a, about a 5% shareholder. Um, but I went to see Tom the Sunday after I became CEO on a Saturday. And um, I went in his office and he had this stack of annual reports throughout his leadership tenure of Cousins. And I thought, oh gosh, <laughs> I hope he's not going <laughs> to give me a homework assignment and make, make me read through those. But the reason he did it is a shareholder letter in every one of those years led with, here are the values that we try to epitomize in our business dealings. I mean, there were years at one point when uh, Tom Cousins' company built CNN Center, uh, this, that was such a bust, the stock got to nine cents a share. You know, and I went to that year to look, and he started with, this is a very difficult time for the company but it's not a time to sacrifice your values. I've been, I was asked a number of years ago to come in and run a company um, that had a broken culture. Broken showed in the financial performance, but also you could just feel it in the organization. And when I look at the history of that, it didn't break all at once. It was just a number of little bitty decisions where the culture got weakened. And then once it gets weakened, it is almost impossible to fix it and keep the company running um, at the same time. So I'll give you sort of a last example of um, 
how just doing the right thing within a culture can pay off. Doing the right thing when nobody's looking. So Cousins Property was, like any real estate company, uh, was under a lot of stress with high leverage and non-performing assets in the 09 and 10 and 11. And one of the things we had to do to delever the balance sheet is sell assets. You know, it was a terrible time to sell assets, but we still had to sell them to begin to delever our balance sheet. Our company had a joint venture with Prudential Insurance Company, and we had a brand of lifestyle centers called the Avenues. There's still some branded that in Atlanta, but this was nationwide, where it was a 50-50 joint venture. It had been in place for 13 years with Prudential, and it had an extraordinarily complex buyout formula that if one partner wanted to buy the others out or one partner wanted to put their interest to the other. And, uh, and it had been a great relationship with Peru. It took about six months just to do the calculations and get everybody to sign off and auditors to sign off. But we ended up putting our interest to Peru and they bought it. The next year, auditors checked off and everything. The next year, one of our folks that had been in one of our branch offices and come back to headquarters um, came in my office and he said, I know that everybody checked off on the formula by which we came up with this, but there's a mistake in it. And we own Prudential a million dollars. No one will ever see it because it's audited and checked off. Probably no one but this guy could understand the complex formula and come up with it. And he said, what do you think we ought to do? And I said, well, there's no question what we ought to do. We've got to call up Prudential and give them their million dollars back. And we called Prudential. The person that we had dealt with had left. We couldn't get Prudential to take the million dollars. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Huge insurance company, the CFO going, what do I call it? And it, it was an error. They finally got over it and took the, <laughs> took the million dollars. Um, no fanfare. No, you know, give us an award for doing the right thing. Um, but about five years later, we were in competition to do something that Prudential was sponsoring. And one of the people had been a junior clerk when that episode had happened at Prudential, and they had actually used it in an internal leadership program. And it happened to be helpful in terms of us winning that contract. And my point is not the, that it paid off eventually. It was the right thing to do if, if they never knew about it because it became the standard again of our company. Of if we work here, we've got to live up to that standard. So um, I didn't write my speech down like Hala, so hers will be much more coherent to understand, but I'll turn it over to Hala. Well, Larry, I'll, I'll thank you for your comments. They were great and they were extremely coherent. I agree with you on the gray areas. That's what we focus on in a business ethics class. It's very easy to make the black and white decisions and figure those out, but there are so many gray areas. Um, and one of the points that I really love as well is it is possible for an entire industry to fall into questionable practices and the leadership that your company showed in trying to elevate that both was ethically the right thing to do and also in the end in many ways benefited your company. Um, and so, um, Hala Modelmog, how is effective as well as ethical corporate leadership developed? Well, I'm going to um, agree with Larry on, on a lot of the things that he said and I, I will take a little bit of a different tact. Uh, but uh, first of all, I have to say how honored I am to be a part of this panel. I don't know uh, Sue Williams and, and Neil the way Larry had, had known them, but um, you can't live in Atlanta and not uh, be familiar with uh, the work and the reputation and um, all that goes with it. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And Dennis, thank you for, for having me. And uh, Georgia Tech, thank you as well. And, and the, the first comment really is, is, again, kind of back to what I think Larry was said in the beginning, is that really if you are doing effective leadership, it really can't be separated from ethical leadership because in the long run, if not the short run, it will catch up with you. And, you know, the, the, the thing that I know um, people say a lot, it's a little bit of a cliche, but it's, it's certainly true, is that 
you know, people watch what you do, not what you say. And um, it's, it's really important that, you know, when you hit a gray area or you hit a, an area that um, is a tough decision that you really kind of step up and do, do the right thing because people will notice and, um, you know, if you have any kind of baseline consciousness or, or uh, conscience rather, you will, um, it will kind of eat at you. I'm, I, you know, just kind of feel that way. And the other comment similar to, to Larry's is to talk about the values. And I have to say this every, I've had the opportunity to, to lead four different groups over my career. And um, every time when we talk about values or look at our values, I always just want to take integrity out as a value. And not because obviously it's not one of the, if not the most important value, but I'm like, Wow, you know, I always say to leadership to the leadership team, if you, if people don't have integrity, they shouldn't be in the building. You know, it's, if you don't have that baseline, so let's make sure that the other values that we're concentrating on are things that you know sometimes you have to work at. Acting is one, and uh, some of those other kinds of things. But I always get voted down. We always have integrity in our values, um, and uh, so you know we we do and. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, as we all know, we've been in corporations, I'm sure, where you put the values up and you don't talk about them anymore. But if you, if you can really use them as that set of things that you live by, and then you can look at your team, you know, from every, every part of the organization, and if something goes wrong, you can ask each other, um, you know, does that, does that fit our values? Are we living the value? And it's, it's a good way to ask a question without insulting someone or making them feel like they're not. It's just, let's, let's kind of go back to that, that baseline. Um, but I, I think this is a very difficult question in a way, because again, I think they can't be separated. Um, so I did, um, as Larry said, I got, got a couple prepared things here, but, but what I really, the, the reason I brought these out is because I wanted to go back to a phrase that was in an email that Sue sent us because it was the thing that, that really caught my attention. It was this concept of civic well-being through responsible leadership. And just that whole phrase caught my attention because I, I have been fortunate to lead a couple of nonprofits. And when you are leading a nonprofit, if you are remotely doing it right, um, you are having an opportunity to um, uh, be a part of, of you know leading civically and um, doing things that that matter in the world the mission is not um, not very hard to um, to understand and people join because of the mission and people give you money because of the mission and things that you want to get done so it it made me think um, a bit about back to my time at um, Susan G Komen for the cure um, you know, we were a breast cancer organization, the, the largest grassroots uh, breast cancer group in the world trying to eradicate um, <coughs> breast cancer. And at the end of the day, what we were really doing, because scientifically this is what we could do, was work on decreasing the mortality rate from breast cancer. But when I got to Komen, um, its, its outside brand reputation was really wonderful. Uh, Nancy Brinker is the founder of that. She's a, a marketing genius and um, the most passionate person you'll ever find, you know, regarding breast cancer. But the organization had grown so fast, um, and it had not been run, you know, remotely like a business because it, it was a nonprofit that just got really big, really fast. And we were, we made um, a lot of our funds came from uh, corporate donations, sixty-five million a year from that. Um, another gigantic chunk um, from the Races for the Cure. But we also made a lot of our money or got a lot of our top line from, um, you know, what we used to say is these, you know, kind of little old women who would send you their last five dollars. And we, when I got there, um, there just seemed to be, and I don't think I'm, I'm speaking out of turn here because Nancy and I have had this conversation, but there was just a lot of waste, but not on purpose. No, they didn't really realize that they were doing it. But we had to make some really hard decisions um, regarding um, reducing the workforce, um, uh, having process to drive results versus a lot of people thrown at a problem. And being a nonprofit and being um, you know fairly new, it had been founded in 1982, um, 
it, that was the first time anybody had ever been let go from Komen. And it, you know, it may not really sound like an ethical issue, but it, it really, it felt like one. But, um, you know, because I had come out of the business world, I had run Church's Chicken before that, I knew um, the ineffectiveness of the way the dollars were being spent and, and the ineffectiveness of the way the science dollars were being spent. So a lot of hard decisions there uh, that didn't feel good to make and really didn't feel good to the people in the organization because their hearts were in the right place and they felt very um, connected to breast cancer because a lot of them did have breast cancer in their family. So you can imagine kind of how difficult that was. But just one quick example, we were um, giving um, out uh, scientific <coughs> grants and we were using um, you know, this incredible methodology that was used by the NIH, um, you know, double blind studies at the time. You can't really do double blind anymore because of the internet. But, um, you know, we had just this big process, 200 people who would work over a number of days. We had all the scientists, the physician scientists, the statisticians, et cetera, and really, um, really thought we were doing a great, great job on, on the science grants. Um, but what we would do, uh, and I, you guys probably know this being at a university, a lot of times a, um, a, a scientist or a researcher or investigator will spend anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of their time getting the grant money versus doing the work. And so we were going through all this trouble, spending all this money, using all these people's time, and then we would give them a grant for a third of the project. And kind of being a business person, I'm like, okay, you know, you, we vetted these people. We've said the science is the right thing to do. It's the right university to do it, et cetera. You know, why don't we just give them the whole amount so that they don't have to spend their time doing the other? So even things like that that seem very logical got to be, um, you know, somewhat controversial. And we, we kind of finally got, got over that. But just a lot of change uh, to an organization that was... Um, that was tough and kind of kind of felt bad sometimes. And we also had a lot of, um, you know, sort of legal issues. Uh, Nancy Brinker at the time when I was there was the chief of protocol for George Bush. So we had, you know, not only the kind of legal and ethical issues with the nonprofit and how you spend money and to Larry's point, how you take gifts or don't in that, that regard. And then someone who's working for the government um, back in those days, it, it was a big deal what you did if you were employed, um, you know, at the White House. And so those things were uh, like walking a tightrope. Um, and at the same time, it was about can we reduce the mortality rate of breast cancer? So you really got, to me, the, the, the tension was, you know, yeah, you want to win, you want to race, you want to move this ahead. Um, but you really better, you get a lot of rules to follow and you better be doing it right. So that was kind of my, in a sense, my first experience with um, getting to do something that I knew was a, a you know, around civic well-being, but had some kind of, um, you know, messy parts to it. Um, and um, I'm now, you know, I have the privilege of running the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Um, and um, so I feel, you know, every day there's some civic good to it. But as I've discovered, as we've studied the numbers, um, you know, we, Atlanta is, you know, really on fire right now. I mean, every, we have so many wonderful things going on and the people in this room know it. We, you know, especially in our technology area, the FinTech area, cybersecurity, you know, on and on with those things. All of the people who've um, chosen to put their digital future here and tech is right in the middle of that. As a matter of fact, just while I'm in the tech campus, I'll just say the number one thing out of anybody's mouth when they're looking at coming to Atlanta is Georgia Tech, bar none. But you, you look at our, our numbers and then you look at our whole community. And um, when I, I was doing some work with Brookings Institution and you know, we're you know, just, again, gung-ho, bragging on these high-paying jobs that we're getting in here, but you can't ignore um, you know, the fact that we have these um, really bad scores, so to speak, on um, economic mobility and um, the uh, divide in um, uh, the gap, the, the economic gap, uh, the income gap that people have here. So if you, if you dial down a little bit deeper on those numbers, with the, the gap and the economic gap, we're really, we're number one for a city, but for our region, and we work with the region, we're, we're number eight. And that, the gap in income is tied very, very tightly, the distribution of 
um, to the, the number of the population. So New York is number one in income, uh, the income gap, et cetera, and on. And we're about number eight there. And that's, you know, that's somebody's always going to be at the 20% low and 20% high. So, you know, we've kind of decided lately, let's focus more on income mobility, on moving people up. And, and the other stat that, that is true for Atlanta is if, if you're born into poverty in Atlanta, you have a 4% chance of getting out. And that's, you know, unsustainable, untenable, and not what we can all bear. So, you know, we went to our, our board, um, these two gentlemen um, being on there, um, and, and for our last st strategic planning uh, process, and we said, look, we think we need to look at inclusive economic development. We, we have to look at the broader picture. So, you know, they're just, um, you know, that's a, to me, that's an ethical issue as well. I mean, you can get the, we, we're, you know, because of Georgia Tech and people like, again, these two men here, you know, we're gonna get the good stuff. I mean, Atlanta is doing very, very well, but I think we'll, all feel that we've missed something if we don't stop now when things are going so well and take a very big broad look and there are many people in this community doing it it's not something we'll lead at the chamber uh, because there are leaders doing it but i think it's something that we have to acknowledge and um, and work through and just real quickly you know since i've talked about my nonprofit experience where you know i kind of get to do the civic thing by definition um, I did run Church's uh, Chicken for a while and uh, Arby's uh, Roast Beef for a while. And um, both of those, in both of those cases, um, we, there was privately held and publicly held and privately held. And, um, and sometimes private equity gets a bad rap and, um, you know, I can understand that to a certain degree. I, I'm not a private equity hater or anything, but I will say this. Uh, well, public companies, the same thing, because you're running quarter to quarter, and then private equity, you've got a lot of pressure, you know, from the LPs and the, the general partners, et cetera. But, you know, you really, if, if you can show in your leadership and convince them and that your team that what you're doing is the right thing for all involved, um, you can stave off some of the things that, that sometimes feel uncomfortable. If you're, again, you know, cutting cost, and sometimes you may feel like some people are, are, are being, you know, not really, and I'm not talking about just employees. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of one thing if you've got employees that you, that you need to let go because of a, a, a financial situation. But in the, church, in the case of churches and Arby's, both, um, these are, were highly franchised um, uh, organizations. And when you take a franchisee, and some of them only own one or two or three um, restaurants or stores, and you know that the things that you're doing are affecting their entire net worth, their entire family, you feel a big responsibility that what you're doing that's right for the brand, what you're doing that's right for the private equity partners, what's right for the team, what's right for anything from a business standpoint, you know, it really needs to be right for them as well. So I think the, the complexity in all this is, is making sure when you're making your ethical decisions that all the constituents are, are being, you know, taken into um, account. And the other thing I'll say about churches, I, I, I led that for about 10 and a half years, and it was just such a joy um, as a brand because in the old days, like in the 60s, 70s, and really 80s, um, there were, I mean, no fast food would go into the inner city neighborhoods, and churches went in there and provided jobs, provided um, good meals at a very low cost. Uh, and we had the most diverse franchisee base in any organization, um, and uh, you know we were very proud of that. And we we have had a few examples of people who literally started out as fry cooks um, and became multi um, multi uh, millionaires, uh, you know, with the brand, owning a lot of restaurants and really doing well. So uh, we always felt like we had kind of a civic pur purpose at, at churches. And sometimes people ask me what's different about running a nonprofit and a for-profit. And actually, I think for-profit is easier than a nonprofit. But you know, in a, in a nonprofit, you know what your mission is. It's crystal clear. In a for-profit, 
you know you got to make money, but you know we said a long time ago, way before it's cool, if it's not more than about the money, then you know it's it's not worth it. And we felt like we really served a purpose in the neighborhoods um, where where we had churches. So I'm I'm just as uh, you know excited about the work we did there as um, as the nonprofits. And I'll I'll stop there and let us hear from John. John, you've got the question already. I know. <laughs> Okay, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Sue, thank you uh, for setting this all up, and Dennis, thank you for inviting us, and Steve, thanks for moderating, and thanks to the two of you for being here. And all of you from Georgia Tech, let me just say it's a terrific uh, privilege and pleasure to be here. I, I did go to Georgia Tech, chemical engineering, a uh, long time ago, and I love Georgia Tech, so I know a lot of you in the room, and it's, it's great to be here and to, to see you. I thought I'd take a little bit of a different uh, tack here because uh, I think when you think about ethical and responsible leadership, which is very important, it's also important to think about what's leadership itself. And if you ask 100 people what leadership is, you're going to get 100 different answers. But I thought I'd just give you a little bit, a very quick view of what John Brock thinks about leadership. And I think it's the same whether you're trying to lead a five-person basketball team, uh, a 100-person uh, club, uh, or a 10,000 or 20,000 person um, organization. You know, basically, is the, ro the role of a leader, and we, almost everybody wants to be a leader in some form or fashion. The role of a leader is to take a group of people, in many cases, not all of the people who are exceptional at doing what they do, and then by working as a group and by leading and by developing to accomplish a set of goals that, in fact, you otherwise couldn't accomplish. I think that's the, the basic role of a leader. And I, I have five uh, things over the years that I've come up with that, at least for me, uh, kind of describe whether you can do this or not. And by the way, leadership can be learned. Anybody can learn it. And uh, ethics is a very significant part of it. So things that are important to John Brock. One, you've got to know where you're going. You have to have a vision. And that doesn't matter whether you want, again, to be the leader on a major R&D project and get $100 million from the NIH. Uh, for your small team or whether you want to lead a corporation. You've got to be able to say, where are we going? Uh, in the case of a corporation, often that means you've got a statement. You know, we wanted to be at Coca-Cola Enterprises, uh, the world's best beverage sales and service company, full stop. Our objective was to deliver consistent, long-term profitable growth, which we defined as increasing share owner value and double-digit earnings per share. We communicated that same set of statements for 10 years, and we outperform the S&P by about a factor of three. So you've got to know where you're going. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a corporation or, uh, frankly, your own personal life. You need a vision. Secondly, you've got to communicate it. If you can't communicate where you're going, there is no chance you're going to get there, unless you're incredibly lucky. Sometimes that does happen. But being able to communicate is an incredible skill. And it doesn't matter whether it's sitting up here and talking to you, whether it's sitting talking across a table over a Coke, or whether you're talking to 10,000 people. <laughs> By the way, we're going to do a right turn on you. You know, Hala said everybody, you know, comes to Atlanta for Georgia Tech. They also <laughs> come because of Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to be able to communicate. And if you stand up in front of a board of directors of 12 people, that requires one style of communicating. If, again, you're communicating to a sales force of 1,000. That's a totally different target audience. And you better figure out how different that is. And again, if it's one on two or one on three, that's very different. And in today's world, and I don't have to tell you this, you know it far better than I, you've got to use every medium that's out there. And it doesn't matter whether it's tweeting or email or, or voicemail, which has basically disappeared, or appearing on video, you name it, you've got to be able to, to use it and be skilled at it. Thirdly, and this gets to the whole concept of ethics, is there are basic things like candor, transparency, integrity, honesty. If you don't have those, you've got a chance of being a successful leader, but not long. You will get caught. And it's just a basic assumption in my book that you have that. Fourth, you've got to figure out as the leader of a group, and again, it doesn't matter whether it's a football team or a drama club, 
who's performing and who's not. And you have to figure out how to incentivize the people who are really performing and then figure out what to do with the ones who aren't. And then finally, you've got to walk the talk. As a leader, the minute you see or the minute someone in your team sees you do some, doing something differently than what you've said, you're dead. It's over and it's finished. You're absolutely chopped liver. You have to walk the talk. Now, what that also means is you ought to pick a few things to set yourself out differently because people spend a lot more time watching what you do than what you say. For me, I decided a long time ago, three companies ago, uh, I was at Cadbury Schweppes where I was a chief operating officer and then at InBev where I was CEO and then at Coca-Cola Enterprises as CEO. I decided a long time ago, before it was really popular, there were three things that were really important to me. One was diversity, not because it was legally mandated or anything else. I, I learned a long time ago, honestly from my mother, that when you have a group of people who are diverse, guess what? You make better decisions. And so diversity for me in all forms, whether it's ethnicity or gender or sexual preferences or anything else, it doesn't really matter. The more diverse the team, the better the result. And I've used that as a very major platform for my companies for the last 20 years. It was no mistake that we had four female directors on the board of Coca-Cola Enterprises at a time when there were only 19 out of the Fortune 500 companies that did. That was a personal leadership decision. Similarly, I'd say beyond diversity is sustainability. I, I concluded a long time ago that employees and associates care about the planet and care about sustainability. And so we picked up sustainability a little bit at Cadbury Schweppes, a lot at InBev, and a whole lot at Coca-Cola Enterprises. And we got to the point where it was the number two driver of employee engagement, which means people liked working at our company because we cared about the planet, we cared about sustainability, we cared about energy, we cared about water, and um, we actually became a member of the Dow Jones uh, Sustainability Index. There are only 100 companies on the globe that are in that. There are only two beverage companies. And the best thing of all was the year we made it, which was three years ago, uh, we had to push somebody off to get on the, to get on the list, and we pushed PepsiCo <laughs> off the list. It was remarkable. So um, those are my five those are my five components. I, you know, I just say one other thing, and that is you do need to be self-aware. I think as a leader and an ethical leader and a responsible leader, the more self-aware you are of yourself, the better the chance, chances are that you can be both ethical and effective. And by that I mean, you know, I know I'm not the world's best at taking um, people who are not great performers and making them into stars. There are football coaches who can do that. There are lots of other people who, I can't. I need to go out and assemble the best team, a diverse team, and I'm very good at letting them go do their thing, but I can't rehabilitate performers. That's simply not on my radar screen. So I would suggest to you all, think about who you are and what you like and what you're good at, and recognize what you're good at and what you're not, and then focus on doing the things that you're absolutely good at. So uh, I think, again, this is a great opportunity for us to come together. Thanks for the chance to pass on a few words, and I'll turn it back to you. I noticed one very interesting thing in both Hala's and John's comments, and you may have noticed it yourselves. Even though there was no coordination at all in the comments, they both actually said pretty much in these words, people are paying attention to what you do, not what you say. And both of them actually said that. When I talk to my MBA students, I ask them, you've been working four or five years. When you did your work before you came back for your MBA, do you feel like you were able to tell who the good people were and who the bad people were and who the ones you could believe were and who the ones were who would say one thing and do another? And they all say yes very quickly. People are excellent at seeing the difference between those two. And when we talk about leadership, I think one of the things that was common to all three of your comments is that tone at the top is absolutely essential because, and this came through from many of your comments as well, people see what you're doing, they get the culture of what you're setting as the standard, and that quickly trickles down throughout the culture of the organization. Now, what we have now is 
two gentlemen named Alan with microphones, and they are going to find people who have questions. And all I wanted to say in terms of your questions is feel free to ask a question to the entire panel. If you're responding to something that one of the panelists said, feel free to just let them know that you're asking them. And I'll ask the microphone holders to take it away. Before we do that, can we give this panel a hand for these wonderful comments they have made? Thank you. Thank you for the program. It's good to see you. Uh, Dean Salbu, it's been a while. Uh, I'm Jim Arnett. I graduated from Georgia Tech in 1973 from the then, at that time, School of Industrial Management, those of you that may remember that, which has been subsumed into the uh, Scheller College now. Um, I wanted to give a, my definition of leadership. Leadership is taking a group of people where they all want to go by a route that nobody wants to go. Mm -hmm. That's good. good Everybody definition. wants to go to the Super Bowl, but nobody wants to go through two days in summer. Uh, I've lettered on the 1972 football team here at Georgia Tech. We finished number 20 in the country, won the Liberty Bowl, beat Johnny Major's last Iowa State team. Uh, and what I want to share with you is about what went on behind the scenes that nobody knew unless they knew a player. We had a quarterback that was an exceptional talent named Eddie McShann. Eddie even wore the number one. And uh, <coughs> he was the first black athlete, at uh, African-American athlete at Georgia Tech. And Eddie um, was a great kid, a great teammate, a great friend, still is a great friend. But Eddie got used by some people downtown, and we don't need to go into that. And he got suspended before the Georgia game. Basically, he went on the Thursday before the Georgia game and asked for 10 more tickets. Well, he'd already gotten four on Monday, which all the starters got. And Eddie's were better than anybody else's because Georgia Tech was not going to do the integration thing the wrong way. So Coach Fulcher had no choice but to suspend Eddie from the game. Eddie drove over to Commerce, Georgia on Friday night before the game and begged to get to play in the game. Coach Fulcher said, you missed practice. You let down your teammates. You can't play in the game. So we basically got the crap beat out of us in Athens, 27 to 3, because our quarterback was a guy named Jim Stevens who take no snaps the whole week because he wasn't going to start. So then we get invited to the Liberty Bowl to play Iowa State. And Eddie is still wanting to get back on the team, and probably teammates wanted him to be back on the team. And Coach Fulcher said, no, you, you, you quit on your teammates and you can't play this year. You, we'll see about next year, but you, you can't play this year. So a kid named Jim Stevens starts, and Jim actually has taught at Georgia Tech since. He's a colonel in the Air Force in the ROTC program. Uh, started in the game. We beat uh, Iowa State 31 to 30 in the last two minutes. The black athletes on our team had death threats that if they came out on the field that they would be shot for not siding with the group that was, um, got Eddie to boycott. Every one of those teammates came out, suited up, played, played their heart out. Uh, and so it's really about team, too. It's about being a team. It's about team being a team. And it's not always about success. Bill Fulcher didn't go on to win 300 games in college football. Bill actually got out of football a year later. I think it kind of just took his heart away for the coaching game. He's a great person, a great Christian man. And uh, anyway, I just thought that might have some bearing. What I wanted to say is it, it isn't always a decision that you make that's all for the right ethical reasons that results in you doubling profit. Sometimes you don't get any financial reward, you don't get any other reward except that you knew in your heart you did the right thing. So if you have any other examples that you had some great ones in your talks of this thing like that, then I would be interested in hearing that. Yeah, this question's for the entire, entire panel. My name's Colt Moran. My question is, because there's so much power in public opinion and so much exposure in technology, what is the new age style of leadership that we have to adapt to try to deal with a diverse opinion with public individuals? And how can we shape our vision and our ethics to still be efficient for our companies in leadership with examples like United and Pepsi having big problems currently because of that exposure and public opinion? It's for the whole panel, panel by the way. Yeah. John, did you want to talk about that? Yeah, the, there, there is no, there's no simple answer uh, for that. I'll tell you what there is in today's world is no privacy, and everything is instantaneous. And I think as leaders, you've got to understand and appreciate that. Um, 
everything is going to be known one way or the other and everything is instantaneous. And when an event like the United Airlines situation happens, it requires the CEO to make an instantaneous response, which I think in retrospect you can say he didn't do particularly well. And um, you, know, you could say it was even worse than that. And I, and I think, you know, you've, as a leader, you've just got to figure out uh, what to do because, you know, we, we know this, you know, from our Coca-Cola situation. I mean, people will make a comment on social media and it just goes viral all over the world. It's not just in Europe. It's not just in the United States. It's all over the world. And so you've got to use technology and common sense, I think, to deal with it. Uh, you know, our old approach of public affairs and communications, and Coke has some of the best in the world, just doesn't work anymore. Because you have no time to think, and everything is out there. And as, as, as long as you understand that, you know, that's the game you're playing. Uh, you've got to play the game that way. You don't have a choice not to. You know, I think, too, it, um, the thing I see leaders make mistakes on is own the problem quick, even if you don't own all of it. Yeah. You know, you can look at it and with the example of United, if the CEO had said the right thing, which was, clearly this is a situation we messed up. It's my responsibility. We're going to get to the bottom of it. It would have been a relatively short live story. Um, I can give an example in the not-for-profit world. I was the chair of the Woodruff Arts Center here in town and uh, during a period of time that it was under a lot of financial stress. This is a private, you know, entity. Gets no public money. Um, we were undergoing a lot of stress with strikes on the musicians and stuff like that. And we discovered that one of the employees down in property management over a period of seven years had stolen over a million dollars. What we did is we called a press conference the next morning before it was fully investigated. We didn't have to be public as a private entity and we owned it. So this has happened. This is a community asset. It's happened. We want you to know about it. We're going to get to the bottom of it and we're going to fix it. Um, there was a lot of trepidation on the board when that happened. No, 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 don't, you know, we need to know more, we need to, and uh, that's also leadership, you know. Don't leave, don't leave one of your teammates, when you're the CEO, don't leave one of them hanging in a meeting. You'll, you'll handle that <coughs> offline. You don't sit in a meeting and say, well, she messed up, you know. You take responsibility and that's leadership. Yeah, I was just to build on that, one of the best sayings I've heard, which I think is so important to, to, as a leader to do, which is basically pass on the credit to others and accept the blame. Absolutely. And if you do that absolutely all the time, then you've got a pretty good chance of winning. Yep. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. So, um, okay. Uh, so my question was for Mr. Brock. I was wondering, you talked a lot about diversity and how that's always been important to you for decision making. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and what your advice would be to companies who don't necessarily value diversity as much and why you think that is. Well, it's a good question because diversity, I think, basically starts at the top. And if you have a CEO of a company or if you have the leader of a basketball team, the coach, whatever, uh, the, the person in the leadership position is, if that person embraces it, you've got a good chance. If you don't, it's going to be really hard to get to where you want to be. I mean, there are lots of things that you can put in place. And I think if you've got an HR team that's, uh, you know, led, again, by cutting edge human resources person, a lot of good things in the way of uh, training and, and, and experiential programs with diversity and why it's important and you know, what women's networks can be and what uh, ethnicity networks can be. But honestly, the single most important thing, if you really want to drive diversity, is start at the top and have the person at the top believe it. Then you've got a good chance. Without that, it's going to be very difficult. Next question. Thank you for coming. My general question is, as people, as we come into leadership positions, um, how do you recommend we empower the people below us to make ethical decisions and to find the right kind of mindset that allows them to navigate those gray areas where it seems like there isn't even a good answer to, to begin with, let alone um, the best answer? 
Well, you know, I think we've kind of mentioned it a little bit, which is uh, if you really start out with a really solid set of values that everybody, you know, on the team feels like they've had some input in, you, you know, you, you turn first to that set of values and put it through that filter, and it definitely can help set up the right kind of decision making. Um, so that, I mean, that would be my, you know, advice off the top. You know, I'd, just, I'd echo something John said. Um, John, my, my thing with companies I'm on the board of or are leading, if you can't give your board a one-page mission statement in terms of what the company strategy is, how you're going to measure it, then you're, you're overthinking your industry. It's got to be so everybody can understand it. The better you are at that and the better you are at living the values and preaching the values, the more an organization can be enabled to make those decisions at the lowest practical level. And at the lowest practical level, they tend to be the best decisions because the people are interpreting it in the context that they're, they're working in. Um, if it's just a top-down mandated thing, it gets misapplied uh, because these are great decisions and they require some judgment. The other thing is you have to get, have an organization that embraces mistakes that mistakes are learning opportunities and you don't have a culture that somebody gets shot when they make a mistake. Yeah, clarity and transparency yep. is, is kind of what you said. And I, we actually had a, a person speaking to us just a few days ago, and um, that person indicated that um, the way they start some staff meetings, their staff meetings, is to talk about what they did wrong during a certain, you know, during the less of the week or the two weeks or just some mistakes they made just to kind of open it up so people felt comfortable with that and to Larry's point that it's okay to make mistakes, everybody's going to make mistakes and um, just if you, you know, in that way if somebody really messes up and maybe it had some kind of ethical uh, kind of side gray issue to it if you've got a culture where people admit their mistakes, take responsibility for them, and feel comfortable talking about them, then because the worst thing, and it's just it's back to these um, these um, PR PR situations recently. I mean, the worst thing is to to try to hide something, or there there is no such thing as spin anymore because of what we talked about. I mean, this everybody's going to know everything. And so just to get it out there, and if you've got a culture of getting it out there, even if something really bad happened, um, your, your organization is going to feel much freer to talk about it and get it surfaced more quickly. I want to uh, thank, I don't think Sue is here, but I want to thank Sue and, and Neil. <laughs> Neil and, and all of you for, uh, for creating this, uh, this incredible forum where I think ethics combination of ethics and effective leadership really does need to be discussed a lot more. We've, as you, as you all uh, talked, I was thinking of two major ethical lapses we've recently seen, not the United, but that is one as well, but uh, one at Wells and one at, uh, at Uber. Uh, highly successful enterprises where we saw major ethical lapses of very different kinds. And I thought about how you, how a leader or a set of leaders can il inculcate values that, uh, with the rank and file employees, that would prevent that kind of thing happening. I loved your comments about self-awareness. Perhaps Wells, as a culture, could have been more self-aware of the heavy sales cross-sell culture that they created, mm -hmm. to the detriment of other things. Maybe it was transparency, more transparency. Maybe it was diversity in the case of Uber. I'd love your, uh, your perspectives on those two, those two examples that we've recently seen on the national scale. I think they're difficult uh, to, to comment on. I, you know, and it kind of goes back to the, uh, the previous question we were talking about. I think the way to protect against those kind of major disasters is you've got to have both quantitative and qualitative things in place. The quantitative stuff is what we were talking about earlier, all of the code of ethics, and understanding, you know, what is acceptable and what's not, and what's inside of trading. I mean, I, you know, in, in companies today, and certainly in a comp company like Wells, you would assume, as long and big, as long as they've been, been around and as big as they are, that they'd have that. I think the more important part is the more subjective, qualitative, gray side of things. I mean, you can go through all the 
quantitative stuff, and I'm presuming Wells probably did, uh, and they checked the box. But on the qualitative side, they missed it. And somehow they, uh, even as a board, I think, okayed a practice that was, you know, in the cool light of the morning, clearly um, not an appropriate thing to do. I'm guessing, I don't know, I'm guessing in the case of the other company you mentioned, they, gr they have grown so quickly and so fast that they don't have the bells and whistles in place on either the quantitative side nor on the qualitative side from the top the leadership. That's just simply a best guess. I don't know. Yeah, I would mention on Wells, too, and I'm not here to pick on that organization. We have a lot of, I'm sure there are a lot of fine people who work there. We, I, we enjoy the people in Atlanta who work at, at Wells Fargo. But I'm really glad to see the clawback of that $75 million because that's got to get some people's attention mm -hmm. because most of the people at the very top who are making, you know, multi millions of dollars, um, you know, they think that money's theirs. And so I, I'm, I'm really glad that finally there was a financial consequence because, you know, maybe if everybody's not going to try to be ethical, at least you can, um, and have a, you know, have a, some lines on the page. And so I, I was just glad that, that the board, you know, did, did go ahead and do that. I, I think it's the, the right kind of message. And Alan, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Larry Keller. I'm a lecturer in business law and ethics here at Scheller. I'd like to uh, thank first Sue Williams because uh, I was not planning on coming here until I met Sue in Starbucks. Uh, I never <laughs> knew her before about 3.15 this afternoon. She told me what was going to go on. I said, hey, I have to come here, and I'm glad I did. Um, I wanted to ask a question which you actually just touched on a bit, and it concerns Wells Fargo. I read yesterday that the law firm Sherman and Sterling just issued a report on the causes of the lapses at Wells Fargo, and substantial blame was put on the shoulders of uh, former CEO John Stumpf, as well as the former uh, retail president. Uh, I forgot her name. Um, and it raises the question, and I think, John, you just touched on it a bit. What is the role of a board of directors in ensuring that you have a culture that's going to promote ethics? And you see an issue with the uh, perhaps predominance or the uh, influence of inside directors uh, who perhaps might uh, make it more difficult for a board of directors to uh, do what they need to do. Well, the Wells Board is a pretty impressive board of directors. When you look at them as a group and as uh, individuals, uh, it's, I think, very difficult to, uh, to say what happened because their audit committee, uh, I would have thought, and their um, HR and compensation committee should have both had a really deep dive into what was going on and understood that. So um, I find it mystifying when I consider I'm, I'm on the board of Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. I know what we do. Obviously, I was on the board of Coco Enterprises. I've been on four other public boards. And, you know, I think, I think public boards today are actually comprised of good uh, quality people who really care and care about ethics and care about their responsibility. And they have a huge fiduciary responsibility. I honestly don't have a clue what happened uh, in the case of Wells Fargo. And I, under, I don't honestly understand why there hasn't been more scrutiny and more pressure on the board itself, because that's, that's part of their job, is to penetrate and probe and understand what's going on. And one thing that, you know, and Wells is a, you know, we're a customer of theirs and theirs a customer of ours and it's a great bank, but you didn't hear the CEO own it right out of the gate. That's right. Yeah. He said, we have a breakdown in middle management. <laughs> and that is a really, really telling comment, not just a bad choice of words, it, it shows a mindset. And, uh, you know, I've been on the bank board for a number of years, and one of the things you always looked at, uh, Dennis Love and I are on board, you always looked at how many uh, additional sales does a teller make to a customer when they come. That's, a, that's an industry thing of, you know, we make four additional sales or three. And Wells Fargo was always well above everybody. And sometimes when you're outperforming, you need to also look at that in a, a humble way. <laughs> <laughs> of are we outperforming more than just because we're great at what we do? Um, and so obviously that culture 
drove a good performance, but then when you brag too much on the culture, it can become uh, going in a different direction than you, uh, you want it to be. And before we head out to the reception that Neil Asks has very graciously uh, decided to host, one more round of applause to our very distinguished <laughs> kind panel. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending. And once again, the reception's outside. <laughs>